Now we're going to move to our endocrinology panelist, Julie Lovshin. Thanks very much, Mansoor, and to the organizing committee for inviting me here today. Uh, once again, my name is Julie Lovshin, and my first disclosure, in addition to these faculty disclosure, is that I am an endocrinologist and clinician scientist at Sunnybrook Hospital here in uh, Toronto. And I'm especially delighted to be here with all of you today to talk about GLP-1 receptor agonist therapy in the setting of type 2 diabetes. Uh, we have just a short time together, but here are the main uh, objectives for today's talk. Uh, and the first uh, point is to have a sort of introduction and practical use approach to GLP-1 receptor agonists, recognizing that some of you may be a little less familiar with this drug class. And then in the latter half, talk about the CV benefits associated with some of the GLP-1 receptor agonists and talk about potential mechanisms to explain these effects. And again, uh, I'm going to start off with polling all of you. Again, it's a bit of an endocrinology-focused question, but nevertheless, here it is. Which of the following statements is incorrect? Is it one, GLP-1 receptor agonists decrease A1C approximately 1 to 1.5 percent? Two, they lower body weight on average 3 to 5 kilograms. Three, they cannot be used with basal insulin. Four, they should not be used with a DPP-4 inhibitor. Or five, nausea is the most common side effect. So I'll give you a moment to think about those. And again, we're looking for the incorrect statement. Okay, again, uh, looking like a very informed audience here. Uh, it is uh, three uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists can be used with basal insulin. In fact, in my patients who are already on basal insulin, the addition of a GLP-1 receptor agonist can be very favorable. Uh, having more glycemic lowering without the additional risk of hypoglycemia and having this insulin sparing effect, which is very popular amongst my patients. So let's then begin of an introduction to the GLP-1 receptor agonist class. This uh, slide is purposely busy because I want you to appreciate that this is a very diverse class. They are uh, anti-diabetic agents, but owing to the fact that they are peptides, uh, they have to be injected in order to prevent uh, breakdown in the bloodstream and, clean and clearance through the kidney. So the first agents that uh, came to be include the top row with liraglutide, exenatide, and lixisunatide, which are once daily injectable therapies. And then on the bottom half of the slide, you can see that the newer agents, including dolaglutide and albaglutide, are, are different. They are a little bit larger. They both contain two copies of human GLP-1, but they're bound to these larger proteins, an immunoglobulin and albuin, that allow them to stay longer in the bloodstream and enable once-weekly administration. Here in the blue bubble, we see exenatide once-weekly is exenatide, but it's formulated in these microspheres that also allows once-weekly administration. So you can see that this class, unlike the SGLT2 inhibitors, is quite heterogeneous, differing by secondary structure, and you'll also note that they differ by sequence. So the yellow circles correspond to human GLP-1, and if we look for a moment at liraglutide, we'll see that it has almost 97% identicalness to human GLP-1. Whereas if we take, for instance, exenatide, you'll see orange circles, that corresponds to sequence differences between human GLP-1 and a non-mammalian GLP-1 known as Exendin-4, which binds the human GLP-1 receptor very tightly. So really the take-home message here is that GLP-1 receptor agonists are a diverse class, differing by sequence and structure. Now the newestly approved GLP-1 receptor agonist in Canada is sumaglutide. Again, very similar to human GLP-1. It has a fatty acid modification that allows for non-covalent binding to albumin, enabling once-weekly administration. Owing to all of the interests in GLP-1 receptor agonists, there are several in late phase development, one of which is an oral formulation of semaglutide, which is co-formulated with this snack molecule that allows for oral administration. 
but presently still in investigational stage. So in terms of GLP-1 receptor agonists, reminding you that they do have robust glycemic lowering properties, and the way that they do so is to activate GLP-1 receptor agonists, GLP-1 receptors rather, at the level of the pancreas. And this causes an increase in insulin and a decrease in glucagon, and there's also a slowing of gastric emptying, which has favorable effects on lowering blood sugar. The reason why I'm here today is that above and beyond these effects on glycemic lowering, GLP-1 receptor agonists had added value or, or ancillary effects in the kidney to affect blood pressure, in the heart and vessels, which we'll hear about in a moment to have protection, in the brain to cause an anti-appetite effect and after chronic use causing reduction in body weight, and as we already heard, an effect on gastric emptying in the gut. So what, what would you expect if you were to start your patient on a GLP-1 receptor agonist? Well, as already mentioned, you would expect robust A1C lowering, as well as body weight loss after chronic use, a reduction in systolic blood pressure, and at least three agents in the class so far have been associated with cardiovascular protection. Now, I think it's also important to understand what are potential side effects if you're interested in starting these therapies. Uh, by far and away, the most common side effect is of a GI nature, where approximately 10 to 20% of patients get nausea. In order to prevent this, what I suggest is to start at the lowest dose and to titrate up slowly. If they were to get a GI side effect, what we do is to bring the dose down to the most minimally tolerated dose to keep it there longer and then titrate up thereafter. I also tell my patients to eat smaller meals, eat more frequently, and to avoid fats. And I educate them. I let them know that this is a common side effect. And the reason why we think this happens is the body has to get used to that slowing in gastric emptying. So patients, uh, obviously, uh, you probably have yourselves experienced this. When you overindulge, you tend to feel full, maybe a bit nauseous. And I think this is part of the side effect. The good news here, though, is that this effect tends to go away after uh, four weeks uh, in most folks and maybe uh, within eight weeks within others. Now, a side effect that I want to talk to you all about here today, I think that you'd be interested in, is that uh, uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist use is associated with an increase in heart rate. On average, two to four beats per minute. Now, we and others have saw more uh, in greater increases in pulse with these therapies. Uh, however, this is more in the acute setting, and it seems to decrease to that average of two to four beats per minute over time. Now, having said that, that uh, and that there is an increase in pulse, I want to reassure you that of the five cardiovascular outcome trials reported to date with GLP-1 receptor agonists, they've all shown cardiovascular safety in patients with type 2 diabetes at high cardiovascular risk, and three of them have reported cardiovascular protection. The first being the LEADER trial, and in the LEADER trial, liraglutide and placebo was randomized one-to-one -one and administered to 9,340 patients with type 2 diabetes at high cardiovascular risk and added to standard care. Patients were followed for 3.5 to 5 years. Um, at baseline, there was a very uh, low minority of folks with heart failure, approximately 18%. 14% had NYHA class 2 to 3, uh, and NHA class 4 was an exclusion. But as you can see, uh, there was a favorable reduction of 13% for the first occurrence to CV death, non-fatal MI, and non-fatal stroke for liraglutide over placebo. And as you can see by the splaying of these Kaplan-Meier curves, the time to this protective effect appeared to be around 12 months and most prominent at 18 to 24 months, and it also continued thereafter. Now, liraglutide is not the only drug in this class that is associated with cardiovascular protection. If you focus your attention on the yellow bars, semaglutide has also been associated with cardiovascular protection in the SUSTAIN-6 trial. And very recently, within the last two weeks, uh, we've s heard the reports of the HARMONY outcome trials with albaglutide, again demonstrated in the purple bars, which has also been associated with cardiovascular protection. Now, as we are interested in heart failure in this symposium, 
I do think it is relevant to note that uh, actually Mansour and Hussein and colleagues have gone back to analyze the data in a post hoc analysis for leader. And what they were interested in determining is whether or not baseline status of heart failure differed in the risk for the primary outcome of MACE and expanded CV endpoint as well as the risk for hospitalization of heart failure. And what he and colleagues found was that there was no interaction between treatment and CV endpoints. In fact, uh, there was a, a trend towards a reduction in hospitalization for heart failure, fearing liraglutide over placebo. So how then do we explain these cardioprotective effects of GLP-1 receptor agonists in the setting of type 2 diabetes at high cardiovascular risk. Well, we do know that these drugs modify traditional cardiovascular risk factors. So there is a consistent uh, effect on lipids. Uh, it is small, but nevertheless statistically significant and consistent across studies. Likewise, after chronic use, uh, there's an association with reducing body weight on average three to four, uh, three to five kilograms, and with the newer agent semaglutide showing slightly greater reductions in body weight as well, up to 6.6 .6 kilograms. Uh, likewise, there is a small reduction in systolic blood pressure with GLP-1 receptor agonists, and we of others have been really interested to determine how these drugs lower blood pressure. We've demonstrated in a small placebo-controlled crossover study with liraglutide versus placebo that liraglutide increases urinary sodium excretion. And as we can see in panel B, we've demonstrated that like SGLT2 inhibitors, GLP-1 receptor agonists are also proximal natriuretic agents. We haven't had as much time to spend on microvascular outcomes, but GLP-1 receptor agonists are also associated with favorable effects on microvascular endpoints, uh, specifically nephropathy endpoints. Now, uh, in interest has also been uh, generated in better determining whether or not there's a direct effect of GLP-1 receptor agonists on the heart and blood vessels. And there is a large body of preclinical evidence. The evidence uh, seems to suggest that one, GLP-1 receptor GLP-1 receptors are expressed in vascular smooth muscle cells, and that the agonists reduce reactive oxygen species in the vascular smooth muscle cells and reduce proliferation. There's also an antithrombotic effect and also a reduction in inflammation and atherosclerosis. So we went through that very quickly, but in the last 30 seconds, here are the key take-home messages that I'd like you to remember from this quick lecture. One, just recognizing that this is a very diverse drug class. Not all uh, members of this class are the same. They differ by sequence and by structure. That they have potent A1C and body weight reduction, and that at least three members of this class are associated with cardiovascular protection in the setting of type 2 diabetes and those with cardiovascular risk. And in addition to modifying traditional uh, cardiovascular risk factors, these drugs are associated with an antiatherosclerotic, antithrombotic, and anti-inflammatory effect. I'm gonna end there thanking you all for attending today and for your attention and by recognizing my research mentors and collaborators. Thank you very much.